Hello everyone, uh, my name is Martin Parker. I'll introduce our speakers in a moment, but uh, welcome to our session, uh, Communicate 2020, on how has COVID changed us? Um, there's three of us who are gonna be speaking. I'll be kind of the master of ceremonies, uh, but Beth and Ruth will be the ones presenting substantive things and I'll just be kind of dancing around them in various ways and responding to any questions that you put in chat. Um, my name is Martin Parker. I'm professor at the University of Bristol in the School of Management. Um, and I'm also the lead for a thing called the Inclusive Economy Initiative, which is our attempt to um, connect the university to the city in order to achieve low, a low carbon, high inclusion, high democracy economy. Um, our two speakers here are Ruth Townend, who will be speaking first, who's research manager in the energy environment team at Ipsos Mori. Uh, she spent much of her career researching sustainable attitudes and behaviours for clients such as DEFRA, Bayes, Scottish Government, Chatham House and Oxfam. And then after Ruth, we've got Dr Beth, Beth Brockett, who's a senior specialist in social science and interdisciplinary working at Natural England and the social science lead for the People and Nature Survey. Um, so each of them will be speaking for around about seven minutes or so. Um, and I won't, I'll, I'll pass over now to Ruth, who I think will be starting. Ruth, can you hear me and okay to go? Yes, I can hear you and... That's great. Then and... the floor is yours. The virtual floor is yours. Oh, excellent. I've already started on the wrong side. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Uh, bear with me one second, sorry. No problem. Um, so at the end of 2019, with Ipsos Global Trends fieldwork complete, the Ipsos team felt confident that sustainability was the hottest trend in public opinion and that 2020 would be the year of the climate emergency. How little we knew then. Our research had found that 80% globally agreed that we're headed for environmental disaster unless we change our habits quickly. These findings were pretty clear and stark. The apparent shift of conversation from vague concepts such as sustainability and climate concern to a concrete and screaming climate emergency was found also in our social media analysis. Across the US, UK, Australia and South Africa, mentions of climate emergency rose to be more than double that of climate change between January and November 2019. Yet while 80% agreed we must change our habits quickly if we wanted to avert environmental disaster, we weren't in fact changing our habits any more quickly than we had been in 2014. We asked what the public were actually doing about this climate emergency that they clearly perceived, um, aside that is from mentions on social media, and not a huge amount was the troubling answer. As part of Ipsos annual research ahead of Earth Day, we repeated a question about likelihood to make shifts towards more sustainable behaviours over the next year. This question had first been asked um, on behalf of Chatham House back in 2014, and it covered a range of behaviours. The findings showed again a pretty clear and pretty stark lack of progress. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble progressing my slides. But then coronavirus hit across the world, bringing unprecedented disruption to normal life. COVID-19 really did change everything. From our hastily constructed home offices, the Ipsos team decided to use a tool the company had created to track responses to the pandemic to snapshot how people were linking the climate and COVID crises. We moved quickly to reach people at this strange moment in time and found a global public already making link, links between the two, supportive of using a green recovery to tackle the challenges of both and politically willing to make their feelings heard. So you can see there that 71% were agreeing that in the long term, climate change is as serious a crisis as COVID-19. Um, that 68% said they felt their government would be failing them if it didn't act now, that 65% were supportive of a green economic recovery and 57% would be put off voting for a political party whose policies don't deal seriously with climate change. And this was right in the early days of the first lockdown in the UK, so mid-April. 
Um, so what was the longer term fallout um, beyond these first links between climate and COVID? How has COVID-19 changed our environmental attitudes and behaviours? So this is a little map that we pulled together during the summer. It was hard to point at that point to know how our behaviours would be impacted. And it's also hard to be conclusive about the potential impacts of those behaviours. Would COVID-19 cause a baby boom? Would people insulate their houses now they were stuck inside them all the times? We didn't, and in many cases, still don't know. Our clients were asking us these questions too. Lockdown lifestyles and environmentally sustainable lifestyles have many overlaps and seemingly impossible behaviour shifts such as a drastic reduction in air travel, a huge downturn in numbers of non-essential car journeys and a big fall in recreational consumption and fast fashion became realities overnight. Ipsos is currently exploring both the extent and longevity of these changes through a number of projects. These include longitudinal qualitative research with Scottish householders on behalf of Scottish Government and Climate Exchange, and also a large scale probability based survey for Bayes, Welsh Government and Scottish Government. Some of you may even have received letters from me asking you to get involved in that research. And if you have, please do so. The initial indications from Ipsos's work suggest that many of the green lifestyle changes necessitated by lockdown might fall away as restrictions ease. One client voiced concern about a potential post-COVID carbon bonanza, and it remains to be seen if this will play out in practice. Ipsos's tracking research means that we hope to be the first to know if, how and why it does. Given the preoccupations of lockdown, you might expect that after the fictional dolphins had swum back out of Venice's canals, climate concern would have dipped as a result of COVID-19. But Ipsos has found that this isn't the case. Agreement that we are facing a climate emergency has increased, if anything, and remains our strongest global value. That said, tired of environmentalism is also a significant trend, with many saying that they are tired of all the fuss that is being made about the environment. So this was 37% of people in the full Ipsos Global Trends study in 2019 and 43% in a seven country update that we did in September of 2020. The mathematicians among you will note that 80% who believe they are facing climate emergency and 37% who are tired of hearing about it must overlap. This overlap strikes me as speaking of disempowerment, sorry, disempowerment even among the engaged. It feels like green fatigue is clearly setting in. So where do we go from here? We have a highly engaged global public who are also quite inert in their behaviours, essentially fiddling with single use plastics while Rome slash the planet burns. Some have asked the question as to whether COVID has created a moment for sweeping lifestyle change, and the answer does seem to be yes. In most countries, the proportion of people who expect to resume regular life is on a downward trajectory. The issue is that while many people in this room might be convinced that the need for sweeping lifestyle change, um, that, that of the need for sweeping lifestyle change to achieve net zero, the message is very much not being communicated clearly to the general public. We're still thinking in terms of discrete palatable lifestyle changes and perhaps at best improving our understanding of what changes would have the most impact. Some of us are also engaging in carbon bargaining. We recycle fastidiously and then those flights to Costa Rica seem like an entirely appropriate reward. The focus is still very much, is it better to have oat milk in my coffee or do the school run by bicycle rather than I'll need to do both and a good deal more than that and quickly. One of the issues, even if a path to net zero lives can be communicated, is likely to be that the public don't feel that they can go it alone. You can see from this slide that the majority think that the government, businesses and the public have equal responsibility, while more feel the government is responsible alone than feel the public are. The public need and want businesses and governments to be playing an active part too, but they aren't necessarily seeing the coherence and meaningful engagement that they need to see from government yet, and certainly not from businesses. 
There also seems to me to be a challenge for communicators of climate change around feedback. COVID-19 has shown how even the most oppressive measures can be considered bearable by the public when the crisis is great enough and the consequences of our actions are clear enough. With COVID-19, we stay at home and we don't hug our mums or our grannies and we see the first, ho first hospital emissions and then death rates dip. Taking action is hard, but the difference it makes is clearly communicated to us. Some kind of net zero feedback mechanism, not necessarily in this format, may be needed if the net zero target is to be seen less as a distant government policy and more as a collective national effort. Finally, if sweeping lifestyle change is in the offing, we need to, it's important that we consider and communicate what lies on the other side of the choppy sea that we need to cross. How will the transition to net zero lives affect our well-being? This is a question that is particularly important given the dire economic situation and the loneliness and isolation people are suffering as a result of COVID-19. At the start of the session, you hopefully took part in a little indicative poll about how you feel about environmental behaviour change. This little online poll of the public shows cautiously positive expectations. While a sizable minority agree that such changes can be hard to make and can involve giving up things we enjoy, these changes also have the capacity to make us feel good and impact on our longer term well-being. The challenge for communicators is to guide and motivate the public to bridge the gap between the burning mandate of climate emergency and the distant beacon of a future that can support flourishing life, both on the planet and for the humans who call it their home. Thank you. That was tremendous, Ruth. You managed to pack an enormous amount into quite a small, uh, uh, a, a small period there. Can I just ask one, one, one sort of opening question before passing on to Beth, which is really about that sort of sense of, um, of efficacy, I suppose. You, you kind of suggested that lots of people might, might be concerned about the climate crisis, but, but kind of not feel that they can do very much about it, apart from putting their recycling out, whatever it is. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit more about how you think people might gain a sense of efficacy? Um, to be honest, I don't think that we are being upfront with people about the changes, the level of change that needs to happen and there's a number of reasons for that i think concern about scaring people um is perhaps quite high up there but at the moment the change the kind of level of lifestyle change that we're seeing is not really going to make a huge difference and until we start communicating about the level of lifestyle change that actually will make a substantial contribution i don't think that we can expect people to feel efficacy because frankly their efforts aren't actually going to make a huge difference. Um, so I, I think it's a case of, of being more upfront about what does need to happen and then having feedback mechanisms so that people can see that making those changes does in fact make a difference and also understand the role that is being played by other parties. The path to net zero hasn't been laid out clearly yet, but I think that process should involve the public. Um, I mean, it already has in many ways with the climate assembly, but the process of sort of laying out the steps that are being taken so that it feels achievable to everybody, I think is one that the public as well as governments and businesses need to be involved in. One question that we've got on the chat. Sorry, Beth, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just, just sort of dealing with a couple of things to, to Ruth. I've got a question from Jack Reed about, uh, do you have any data on how people's perception of the relative responsibility of public government and business is changing over time? In other words, are, I guess, are people, you know, now thinking it's more about business or more about government or more about us? Mm -hmm. We do ask a tracker question around this. I haven't got the figures to hand, um, but if you get in touch with me, um, my email address on the screen, I can pull out some figures for you to show. I don't think there has been massive change over time. Um, it would be interesting to see how sort of how sort of personal efficacy did change if there were changes in the way that we were communicating about this. That's great. Thanks, Jack. So if you uh, you email Ruth um, on the uh, the mail she's got there, the Ipsos.com mail. Ruth, that's terrific. Uh, if you uh, stop sharing now and then we'll pass over to.
Um, okay, Hi. Beth. Okay, so right. you've now got your you've now got your seven minutes of fame. Okay, okay. Right. Let's try and share my screen. Hopefully, you can all see that. Um, That's great. Yeah. Lovely. Okay. So, hi everyone. Um, thanks for that, Martin. Um, and and Ruth, that was really interesting, and I think we should talk more. Um, I'm here to speak to you um, today about how coronavirus has impacted on our interactions with, with green and blue spaces and by that I mean spaces such as canals or parks or the general countryside, the coastline, anywhere basically that isn't that's getting out into, into nature but not um, private gardens. So what I'm going to present here draws on Natural England's People and Nature Survey and you can see our user hub page scrolling away in the background. And this is um, mainly data collected between April and June this year, but the survey is ongoing. It goes on all year and it gathers evidence and trend data. Um, it's an online survey and it's um, as well as uh, about interactions with green and blue spaces. It's about um, gathering data relating to people's enjoyment, their access and their understanding of an attitude to the natural env environment. And it draws from a representative sample of 25,000 English adults per year. It's a new survey, it started in April, good timing, um, but it builds on 10 years of data collected by the Monitoring of Engagement with the Natural Environment or MEANI survey, which you hear me refer to. So um, hopefully you will see a poll come up on your screen. Um, Martin, is, have you seen a poll? <laughs> I can see I can see the time for a poll thing. I don't know if that. Oh, the poll okay. Is. If it doesn't come up, that's not a problem. If it pops up, um, at I some guess point. that the talented Stu is somewhere in the background putting the poll. Up. <laughs> a poll might pop up on your screen <laughs> at some point. Um, if you can just answer the the question: Since coronavirus restrictions first started, I have increased the amount of time I spend outside. So um, it's just a yes or no question. So. Um, um, hopefully we'll get the results of that at the end but um the poll is um, up the poll is oh, up. lovely the poll is up excellent i think i have to take part in order to no i can't take part because i can't see it someone will have to tell me the result at the end that's fine <laughs> so um if you fill that in um basically we found that 40 percent of adults in england um this spring um said that they're spending more time outside um as a result of, of, of coronavirus, I guess, and the changes to our lifestyles. That's actually increased the, our latest September results, that's increased to 47%, which is interesting. And we also found that, um, uh, I should move this on, and we also found that 31% of um, English adults are exercising more in outdoor spaces, and 74%, um, a huge amount of people have been taking more time to notice and engage with everyday nature. However, this is a tale of two halves. So one in three adults this spring didn't visit a green or blue space um, within the last fortnight um, when they, before they filled the survey in. And one in five adults hadn't visited in the last month. And indeed, we found that the number of people visiting these spaces this spring was lower than we would expect considering the long term trends identified by the previous MEANI survey. So why are some people visiting less or not at all? So you can probably guess the main reason people gave is to stop coronavirus spreading and because of government restrictions. And that accounted for 67% responses on average this spring. This has changed over time and this graph is derived from the People and Nature Survey too, but from our monthly reports where we release a subset of indicators. And you can see the relative importance of COVID and the weather over time in preventing people getting outside into green and blue spaces. Other key barriers identified were being busy at work, um, well, being too busy generally at work, at home with family commitments, and that was 15% of responses. And poor health or well-being, that's physical or mental, which is also 15% of responses. Also, antisocial behaviour and lack of facilities were flagged as concerns by this group who are getting out and we're undertaking um, qualitative research with the University of York to understand how different COVID related barriers such as taping off benches affected people differently. So are there any particular communities that are getting out less? 
So don't look at the tiny figures. Um, you just need to know that the vertical axis is showing the proportion of adults in England. Um, and then you can see that, um, the horizontal axis is um, income and deprivation. So we can see here that poorer and more deprived communities are getting out less into nature. And the same patterns are seen for less educated and unemployed people. So socioeconomic factors play a role. We also found that having a long term illness or condition makes it less likely people will visit green and blue spaces. Also, adults from ethnic minority groups were less likely to visit and older adults, perhaps unsurprisingly, less likely to visit. And these do reflect pre-COVID patterns, but we have evidence that COVID has exacerbated these inequalities, which is very concerning. So we know that children feel happier when they spend time outside, their parents and carers tell us so. Um, we also know that having children in your household means you're more likely to be spending time in green and blue natural spaces. But we wanted to ask children themselves about their experience of nature and getting outside during the pandemic. So we did that this August with 18 to uh, eight year olds to 15 year olds. So I think it's the first time that a survey like this has been um, undertaken. And 80% of children agreed that being in nature made them very happy. And children were more likely to agree if they spent more time outside and more time noticing nature and wildlife. However, 60% reported they'd spent less time outdoors since the start of coronavirus. So that's more than double the proportion that spent more time outside, so that was 25%. And it seems that far fewer children are spending more time outside since coronavirus started than adults. So it's 40% of adults, 25% of children. So that has just been a whistle-stop tour of some of the findings from the People in Nature Survey. There's a lot more to dig into. Um, we released our quarter one um, data. You've got, you can access all of the data and some, some of the headline findings. We're also about to release our quarter two data. So that will be from July, or the, July to September soon. We've also got monthly um, indicators released, as I said, and the children's survey. So yes, please do have a look and get in touch if you'd like more information. Thanks very much. That's terrific. Thanks very much. Just apologies in advance in case anybody hears any kind of uh, nasty noises in the background for me, because I've got some people putting scaffolding up next door, which is particularly helpful right now. Can I just ask Beth a couple of sort of questions about, about the data? Because questions, I mean, which you might broadly gloss as social class seem to be really relevant here. But do you have ways of breaking your data down in terms of, say, the relationship between class, ethnicity, education, gender? Yeah, so we've, we are very keen to look at um, what you might call intersectionality um, in our data. Um, because the survey started in April, when we released the first quarter data, which is what this is released on, we had about 6,000 um, respondents. It wasn't enough really to start breaking down um, sort of into finer groups or to look at that intersectionality, but that is definitely a plan for us to do that in the future, yeah. So the so the general the general message in some sense then would be well there's two possibilities here aren't they the people who live in leafy suburbs and are already reasonably well educated and quite affluent might be people who are getting out into nature but that doesn't tell you anything about their prior orientations to nature anyway does it um well i suppose when, when we're asking about if you're getting out more we're sort of specifically asking about that more so we could sort of break that down we also mm. look um about we ask people about on average over 12 months how often do you estimate you get outside so we can sort of look at that and see if it's um so it is it's something we could look at in terms of the different subpopulation and i don't know oh we've got the results from your poll there Oh, there you go. See if we're representative as a group. <laughs> That's right. So we had uh, yes, but there were a, a yes was seventy percent and no was thirty percent. Wow! So that's a lot higher than the national average. Then we are a outside group. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Possibly not a very surprising finding in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of environmental communicators. Does that the, does the, the data that you've got? I'm just sort of connecting it to Ruth's presentation. Um, and I know I'm asking you to speculate way beyond the data here, but are there are there any particular reasons you find in that for optimism about the way in which ordinary 
British people think about nature and how that might affect their orientations to questions about climate change? Yes, I think so. I think although we're seeing inequalities in access to nature, I think we are seeing, you know, 74% saying they're noticing everyday nature, more so people even obviously who aren't getting out are still sort of looking at, um, you know, looking at nature out the window, listening to birdsong. Um, so I think people, I think there's sort of a, I don't know, again, I'm speaking beyond the data, but it's a feeling, isn't there? There's a bit of a national consciousness um, around the importance of, of local nature. So I'm I mean, people using urban parks also, we already knew urban parks were incredibly important before COVID. They're, they're, they're equally, if not more so important now. So I think there's sort of an understanding that we need to put um, more uh, notice on our local nature. Um, we're also in looking at, um, with the University of Surrey, we're looking at um, in more detail into the, into the data, but also um, some longitudinal surveys um, following tracking people. So we hope to have some um, data sort of from people's experience and whether that behaviour continues um, sort of as we move, hopefully post COVID. Um, and we're also looking with them at some social media analysis. So Ruth mentioned social media analysis. We're looking at, um, there's a paper we're hoping to publish soon, looking at um, people sort of how they use nature online um, and sort of what, you know, looking at Spring Watch and things like that and people's responses to it. So I think coming out of this, we will have a lot of data, a lot of interesting things to report. And I, I don't know, it feels like a change in the way people perceive, especially their local and everyday nature, but we'll see. Question from Anne Nicola on the chat here, uh, who asks, do you know if the encouragingly high percentage of people who are noticing nature on a small scale then translates to higher nature connectedness measures? Um, we will. Be looking at that we do measure um the, the sort of the six five um elements of what is the nature connection index um which natural england have developed with the university of derby um so we will be looking at that um and it we've actually just put um, a blog on our user hub which miles richardson where from the university of derby which looks at children's nature connectedness um, and we'll be working with miles and others to sort of report on that as, as it comes up so yeah keep keep an eye on the user hub Thank you very much. Let me just talk a little bit about the uh, the stuff that I've been doing. I don't have any PowerPoints because I was going to try and sort of respond to some of the things Beth had been talking about. I'm an academic with an interest in alternative business and economy and you know particularly in terms of ideas about low carbon and high inclusion and so on. Um, and when we started to uh, go into lockdown in March, um, I and this echoes Ruth's findings very much, I think, was quite optimistic about the way in which a certain kind of crisis might become a particular kind of opportunity. Very mindful of the echoes there of the financial crisis a decade previously, where it seemed uh, for a moment in 2000, 2008, like the kind of global financial system was actually shifting in some quite structural, quite systemic ways. Because the sadness after that was that nothing very much really happened in terms of global finance. and. Uh, we pretty much settled into you know, money as usual. This crisis, the COVID crisis, maybe because of its nature, its duration, its global impact and so on, seemed to me then and still does seem to me as, as, a, as a really interesting way of talking about a variety of kind of reset metaphors. And obviously we've seen lots of lots of stuff on social media about this and more generally activist groups like Extinction Rebellion and, and Sunrise and so on, talking about the idea of no going back and build back better and all the rest of it. Um, so in um, about April, I put together an edited collection called Life After Covid, um, and it was a kind of quick and dirty collection of um, short essays by academics and activists of various kinds, mostly around the kind of Bristol area where I work. Um, and we had essays on um, on work and on transport and on money and a whole variety of things in terms of this idea that nothing could ever be the same again. And I must say, when the book came out in August-ish, um, I was already starting to feel like we'd missed the opportunity, you know, as if there was a certain sort of a certain moment that had opened up and that was now closing down again. I guess a couple of months later, I'm now a bit more sanguine about that because it does seem to me that a whole variety of policymakers in lots of different areas 
are now kind of recognizing that 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 COVID may well be a, a kind of a dress rehearsal for the kinds of systemic changes that we need to make in order to deal with climate change. So, you know, you can take individual examples of this and expand them out. So the one I just want to want, want to sort of talk about briefly is the idea of of, of working at home, um, which of course I'm doing at the moment, which is why you can hear the scaffolders next door. Um, so working at home initially, I think, was being presented as um, a very double-edged thing. For some people, it meant that they weren't having to get stuck in traffic or, you know, sit on uh, overcrowded and expensive trains and all the rest of it. At the same time as people were also talking about the difficulties of establishing a home office or dealing with various kinds of caring responsibilities or the impossibility of ever leaving work. You know, that's the, the paradox in a sense, isn't it? Working at home means you're always at work, et cetera, et cetera. So there were lots of different ways of talking about this kind of stuff. But at the same time, it does seem that um, from my own conversations with a wide variety of employers, that there is kind of that there's no real way of going back to the idea of, 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 of a certain sort of presentism for lots of people who are involved in knowledge work. Not everything, obviously, because, you know, people who work in warehouses or drive buses or work in care homes are you know not going to be able to work at home anytime soon. Um, but for, for a wide variety of knowledge workers, it seems that we might be entering an era of, of a much more flexible approach to working. This is something that people have been talking about, sociologists of work and so on, since really the 1960s, 1970s, with the advent of the possibility of various kinds of home working. So there could be quite a defining moment here in terms of the way in which people conceive of the relationship between the work and the domestic space. And that has a number of implications, obviously, in terms of the ways that we think about urban spaces, too. So if there is going to be less traveling, as has been you know, mentioned um, in, a, in a variety of ways, then it's highly likely that city centers are going to need to be repurposed in some interesting ways. Um, there's already much evidence of a downturn in demand for the kind of office space that's often built speculatively in large city centres, particularly near transport interchanges. I mean, again, for those of you who, who know Bristol, around Bristol Temple Meads, you know, big railway station um, within uh, our 20 minutes of, of, of central London, um, there's an awful lot of office stuff being built currently. Much of that, it's rather difficult to see um, how that's going to be fully occupied. So some of that may well have to be repurposed into residential accommodation. And that in itself then has implications for a whole series of the businesses that occupy the city centre. So, you know, the kind of, you know, this has been again mentioned in the context of London train stations, hasn't it? That all the kind of the sandwich and coffee shops and all the rest of it that currently provide a sort of an ecosystem for the city um, may well be, um, uh, may, may well find it difficult to make their money in the ways that they historically have been. Now, the reason I'm talking about those kinds of things is because they then lead into a, a wider reconsideration of the nature of the city itself. The city, in terms of the ways that we've understood it, really, since the kind of well, 16th, 17th century in Europe, really, uh, particularly large cities, have been kind of places that pulse inwards and outwards, haven't they? With you know the idea of the of, of some sort of some sort of residential areas and then some sort of work areas, and they've changed in terms of the way that we understand that stuff. But effectively, we're talking about various kinds of movements within a city, and also a sense, particularly in the last century or so, of certain kinds of cities as being central to transport links and so on. So London, for example. And the, um, and the construction of railways in this country. Now that notion of the city could change. We might not be thinking about large population concentrations and large concentrations of jobs in certain kind of metropolitan areas. That itself might change. Again, the reason for talking about those kinds of things is that they open up the possibility of substantial forms of system change um, which are the result of some quite small changes that come out of this tiny little, the tiny little COVID creature. Yeah, so, you know, we can almost kind of scale these things out, my sense that, you know, we can begin by talking about a response to the virus that would then become something about you know, people working at home, which then becomes something about the design of cities and transportation networks and so on. So it's almost as if there are kind of systemic implications in the ways in which we might be dealing with the virus more generally. And I just want to conclude with one thought and then connect back to, to Ruth and then to Beth as well, which is that the, 
one, the, though the kind of the destination of travel is kind of unclear, one of the interesting things that lots of people seem to be talking about at present is the idea that we can't go on as we are. Now, how you interpret a statement like that is obviously complicated. You know, I'm talking to two, two people who are experts in, 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 in polling in a variety of ways. But, but the idea that the present system is reaching a kind of exhaustion, whether that's in terms of, of its, its spatial construction, the relationship that we might have with work, the relationship we have with nature and so on, does seem to be a very persistent sort of narrative, you know, a very persistent set of ideas. The question really is, what does it look like in the future then? So pitching that question to Ruth, because you alluded to it very directly, how do you think environmental, communica environmental communicators can tell effective stories about what life after COVID might look like? Hmm. That is a really tricky question. And I'm not <laughs> well, primarily a communicator. <laughs> But um, I think one thread I've personally been very interested in and I'm currently writing an Ipsos thought piece about is um, the implications of net zero for human well-being. Um, and I think that this is a really important area that hasn't really been very well engaged with, perhaps because we're afraid that making these changes is going to involve giving up a lot of things that do support our well-being so for example um international travel um decarbonization of air travel is something that the uk climate assembly members were sort of keen to prioritize and in order to not have to stop people from traveling um, travel is important because it enables us to see members of our families who live abroad, but also it's very central to our personal and family time, um, to spending sort of quality time with the people we love. Um, and I think it, it sustainability poses a real challenge for finding ways in which we can continue to do these unsustainable things that support our well-being but in more sustainable ways or that we can find other activities that support our well-being to a similar extent that actually will sort of support our future at the same time um, so i think i think it is hu a huge challenge and there are many different aspects of well-being as there are many different aspects of sustainability the framework i'm using has 12 different aspects of human well-being which I'll tell you, it leads to a quite a long thought piece, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think it, I think it's something that if we do engage with, we will get a very strong response from people, because often when we talk to members of the public about the reasons they've changed their behaviour, actually sustainability is not on the list, or if it is on the list, it's a kind of and it's good for the environment at the end of a long list of other reasons why they make the change, and I think as environmentally focused researchers or communicators we tend to sort of think in terms of how can we get people to make these sustainable behavior changes when in fact the changes are what matter and the reason behind them doesn't really matter at all um so i, I think that's that's my sort of core focus at the moment but others may have may have other ideas about how we can achieve this just to observe that very often you've got the usual sort of paradoxes here and if you ask people whether they want to pay more tax they say no if you ask them whether they want better public transport they say yes so you know it's the kind of there's no particular yeah. reason to assume that there's a kind of rational calculator here but interestingly we've been doing some research on behalf of the royal society about the future of landscapes in the uk um and the, these findings aren't published so this is my anecdotal evidence from taking part in the groups and um, moderating the groups um but people have shown a degree of willingness to to pay for the upkeep of natural spaces and investment in the upkeep of natural spaces and just again anecdotally talking to people about how they've engaged with nature during lockdown just to reflect on Beth's points the kind of passion for nature and the importance and centrality of it in people's lives has been hugely striking and there are lots of things such as engagement with nature that are uh, deeply sustainable because uh, well as long as it's done you know in a way that doesn't sort of leave litter all over the lake district um that they, they sort of ha have that function so 
I think I think people may be more willing than we think um, to do things that that we sort of have assumed they will be unwilling to do. It's about sort of explaining the consequences and getting them to engage more deeply. That's lovely. Uh, that's nice. There's a nice way of um, summarising that from someone called Adam uh, Chimlowski in on the chat. Um, the, the just just pointing out that the idea of living more sustainability living more sustainably isn't necessarily a good explicit goal but an outcome of something else and his question is our env environmental campaign is leaning too heavily messaging at the expense of other narratives which motivate mass interests more yeah i think the ties between health and sustainability are quite extensive i mean from from sort of local air quality issues to active travel to eating less meat and dairy there's so many sort of health benefits interwoven with sustainability activities and health is a huge motivator for behavior change so i think the answer to that is probably yes um there's a lot of just, other ways we can skin a cat so to speak yes exactly just just to just to bring beth in i've got quite a, ni a nice question here which you might know about but also just to comment on 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 the conversation that i and ruth have been having which was about dog ownership is there any evidence that um uh, there's been a rise in dog ownership and people obviously using the dog as a proxy for getting into nature um well, I think anecdotally, considering the number of people in my team that have now got a dog, I think probably yes. We do ask people about dog walking in the People and Nature survey. So I haven't actually got that those things in front of me, but we can certainly look at that over um, sort of the from Meany, the pre sort of um, the dog walking often comes up as very high in the list of activities people do. So we can certainly look at that with the data. Um, so I think yes, that probably is something to, to watch. Um, in terms of the um, conversation you've been having, I, I think one sort of not very thought through sort of three points on that. So first is I think something about time here as well, isn't there? Something about having time to um, to, to live in a way that's sort of uh, better for ourselves and, and for the planet. Um, and it'd be interesting to see whether we feel like we have more or less time. I certainly don't think I've been working any shorter hours since this all started, but we'll see. Um, in turn, uh, I think the second thing to say is I think it's about represent. We do, we're talking about representative breadth here in terms of sort of you know polling large numbers of people and getting things. I think there's something also from a social science perspective about representative depth, and I think some of this has to um, be supplemented with really robust qualitative studies. So like the work we're doing at the University of York, we know the big messages about barriers to getting outside. We're now doing some really interesting work all online obviously around trying to understand people's experiences and barriers from some of those um, some of those groups and then I think also it's a I think it's really important like you said Martin to paint a picture of what does it look like and just um, just from a sort of access to nature perspective I think it's um, it's understanding well if we do want more people um, to be accessing local nature like we have seen um, what does that look like and what has to change? Um, and I think, you know, there has been sort of obviously the pictures of the very busy beaches and the litter left behind, but I don't know, but I, um, it'd be interesting to see if there's any research that's done on sort of the, how much, whether that's more of a headline thing or if that's actually been a big problem, but also, okay, if, that's, if we are going to encourage more and different people out into the natural world, what does that look like? Where are they going to go? How can we prepare them so that, um, Maybe there's just more facilitation for them, so they um, so we haven't got sort of the same honeypot issue. And how do we improve children's confidence yeah. to get off the beaten track um, and to use um, nature in a sustainable way? So, I mean, those are just my personal thoughts. But I think, um, like I said, that using case studies as well as nar a narrative is really important. Okay. Yeah. No, that's that's really interesting. And I guess I'm going to be uh, going to be winding up now. I've got I've got the, the chat telling me we need to stop. So thank you very much. But just to point out that there's a kind of a difference between talking about nature and talking about sustainability, and maybe that's a gap in which we could kind of exploit a bit more. Uh, so Martin, can I just say there are a couple of questions about weather and children. That if people want to get in touch with me directly, I'm okay. happy to answer. That's great. We have way too many questions for the uh, for the length of the session. So can I wind up there? Thanks very much to Ruth Townend from uh, Ipsos Murray and Beth Brockett from Natural England. 
and goodbye from me from the University of Bristol. Thanks very much indeed, everybody. Thank bye you. bye. Bye.